In today's webinar, ICANN 58 Copenhagen Recap, we'll be hearing from two of the Mark Monitor team who are at the event in Denmark and who will share the most recent ICANN developments and their implications for brand owners. I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speakers. We're joined by domain experts Kiran Malanacharyavel and Janelle McAllister. Kiran is the policy counselor at Mark Monitor. She's responsible for monitoring the legal, legislative, political, and regulatory environment around brand ownership. She represents the interests of Mark Monitor at ICANN, where she's the secretary of the Intellectual Property Constituency. She is also a subcommittee chair on the Internet Committee for the International Trademark Association. Kiran has taken a leading role defending brand and consumer interests on policy and advocacy issues related to the new GTLD program, accessibility of website ownership data, and online abuse and consumer fraud. She's a trademark attorney with experience in international and domestic trademark prosecution, litigation, anti-counterfeiting efforts, and brand protection counseling. Janelle is our Registrar Policy Manager. With 10 years of experience in the domain industry, Janelle has worked with a large number of registries on behalf of Mark Monitor becoming an accredited registrar. Janelle manages the Domain Global Relationship Team at Mark Monitor, who is responsible for the GTLD and CCTLD registrar accreditation. Janelle has worked with multiple CCTLD registries to implement account and domain security features, including registry lock. And Janelle is actively involved in ICANN and is a voting member of the Registrar Stakeholder Group. She's also a member of the URID Registry Registrar Advisory Board. So with that, we've got a lot to cover, so I'll go ahead and turn things over to Kiran to get us started. Thanks, Ian, and welcome everybody to the ICANN 58 Copenhagen Recap Webinar. We're happy to have you join us. Um, so on today's agenda, we're going to um, go over some of the highlights um, of the Copenhagen meeting, the 58th public meeting for ICANN. We're going to talk a little bit about what Mark Monitor was up to at the meeting. Um, we will review the new GTLD program, stats of the current round, discussions about the next round or subsequent procedures, and what's going on with the review of the rights protection mechanisms. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about the progress of the Privacy Proxy Services Accreditation Implementation Team. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what's going on with the discussions about the future of who is and the next generation registration, registration directory services. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of Mark Monitor's partnerships and policies with, uh, related to ICANN. And finally, we'll talk about um, both why and how brand owners should be getting involved in this space. So to begin, I'll run you through some of the highlights from the meeting. Um, we uh, met from March 11th through the 16th in Copenhagen, Denmark. It was a beautiful city. The weather was, was pretty good, um, and we had, a, we had a really good time there. Um, it was the ICANN Community Forum, which is a six-day combination of intra-community work, uh, which you probably know most as the policy development processes. Um, high interest topics or um, topics that are, are, are sort of of interest to cross community groups and people that aren't necessarily associated with specific community groups, but um, things like domain abuse and who is are considered high interest topics that I can. Um, GDD track work, GDD is the Global Domains Division and um, is related to the interests of the contracted parties, the registries and the registrars. Um, there were uh, there was a public forum. There were actually two public forums at the um, at the meeting, and then of course there was some ICANN board work and a, and a board meeting, including their traditional meetings with all of the constituency and stakeholder groups. The focus of the meeting um, was on uh, primarily on the intercommunity and policy work. Um, discussions about the subsequent rounds of the new GTLD program were sort of prime and right up top. Uh, the rights protection me mechanism, specifically the trademark clearinghouse, was a huge topic of discussion. Who is a registration directory services continues to be a huge discussion with multiple tracks of work happening within ICANN. Uh, pri privacy proxy was a big deal. And discussions about geographic terms and how governments are balancing their interests with trademark and brand interests is also a huge topic of discussion. And while that seems like a niche issue, um, we'll talk a little bit farther, uh, a little bit um, 
a little bit more later in the webinar about why that's especially in, uh, of interest to brand owners sort of globally and not just those that have related geographic term trademarks. So I'll pass it off to Janelle to talk a little bit about what is going on with uh, Mark Monitor when we attend these meetings. Yeah, thanks, Karen. So let's look at an overview of what we're involved with at ICANN 58. So to start, uh, we were the proud sponsor of the DNS Women's Cocktail Party on Wednesday night. Uh, at each ICANN meeting, ICANN does do a survey of all ICANN participants to get an idea of the demographics um, of the people involved. And historically, ICANN participants um, are made up of 75% men and 25% women. And the DNS Women's Networking Group brings women together uh, to network and encourage more participation from women. Uh, at this event, the president and CEO of ICANN, Yorn Marby, spoke, uh, as well as the chairman of the board, Steve Crocker. Karen and I also had the opportunity to speak about the importance of women's voices at ICANN. And uh, this event also honored Glenn Desangri, the GNSO secretariat, who uh, retired at the end of this meeting. And I just want to say thank you to everyone that attended the event. Uh, it was the largest DNS women's networking event to date, which was very exciting for us. And at the Copenhagen, Copenhagen meeting, we had more clients than ever participate in an ICANN meeting, and this included a couple of first-timer uh, attendees. And Karen and I also always enjoy mentoring first-timers, is I think we both clearly remember how overwhelming uh, ICANN meetings can be the first time. Uh, so we do help people that are going there for the first time uh, to understand what groups they should participate in, including uh, member groups and policy development processes and things like that, um, to help them understand where they can make the, the largest impact. Uh, we had seven Mark Monitor employees in attendance in Copenhagen, and we attended over 100 sessions and meetings. So it was a very busy six days for us. Um, and in these, the meetings that we attended, we focused on uh, talking to clients to understand brand holders' concerns at ICANN. Uh, we also advocated for brand holders, uh, both within the policy development groups, but also on a one-on-one -on -one basis with specific registries. Uh, we also are actively participating in the policy development process, which we'll get into further on. And we also identified and participated in education and awareness activities throughout the meeting. Um, and we're also very engaged in our individual constituency and stakeholder groups. So to get more into the specifics of the group, so let's talk about the current status of the new GTLD program. So as of April, uh, we have 1,216 new GTLD strings that have been delegated. Um, and there's also 1,241 registry agreements that have been signed. Um, within all of those, that means there's 543 live dot brands. That means the dot brands that have fully launched, um, and 112 active dot brands. Now that the the new GTLDs have launched, registry operators are starting to switch their focus uh, to release premium domains. They're also evaluating their pricing, uh, making changes on that level, and they're also making more uh, doing more marketing efforts to try to encourage people to actually uh, start using their new GTLDs. We are also starting to see multiple TLDs change hands, meaning the registry operator is changing from one registry operator to another, and we expect this to be a major trend of 2017. With the new GTLD registrations, uh, currently just under 60% of domain names are parked. Uh, this has, the number has decreased over the past year which does show that more people are starting to use their new GTLD domains, which I think is exciting for all of us uh, to see. So to talk uh, specifically about dot brands, a question that we get on a regular basis is how are people actually using their dot brands now that they are active and live? And this uh, graphic shows most popular domains within the dot brand space. Uh, so the most common name for dot brands to use is home dot brands. Um, followed closely by mail.brand, www.brand, uh, and cloud.brand. And I think this is interesting to know uh, what other people are using their dot brands for, but also what you could start using your dot brand for as well. So next, I will pass it back to Kieran and talk more about uh, the new GTLD subsequent rounds. Thanks, Janelle. So um, the new GTLD subsequent rounds uh, policy development 
process working group met a couple of times in Copenhagen. Uh, they were the first up meeting uh, bright and early on Saturday morning in Copenhagen where we had a, uh, a long and arduous face-to-face -face meeting of, of the entire policy working group. Um, we got uh, work track updates and on the next slide we'll talk um, again and review about what the work tracks are and the subjects that they are individually exploring with relation to subsequent rounds. Um, so we got their updates um, with the goal of developing community comment to questionnaire, which is now out and available for public comment. The community comment to is a series of questions related to each of the work tracks uh, broken into broad topics and then specific questions for the community. It's a pretty extensive document. I sat down here in Boise with my team uh, or, or the team of policy experts here uh, to work through it and we got halfway through in an hour and a half. So it's really, really extensive um, questionnaire. Uh, not, not every brand owner is going to be interested in or even qualified to answer a lot of the questions, but everyone is encouraged to look at the list of questions, figure out which ones relate to them, figure out which questions um, they have an opinion on, and then express that opinion because that will continue to inform the policy working group as we move forward through addressing some of these issues and how we shape the policy of the new GTLD program moving forward. And I know brand owners have a lot of input about how the new GTLD program um, was launched, how it was implemented, how DOT brands applied, you know, uh, even education and awareness about applications and the fact that it was even happening. Some huge brands didn't even know it was happening until the application window was already closed. And so, if you're one of those brands that even has a passing interest in what's happening, you're going to want to look at this community comment um, opportunity, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on how to get involved. Um, on Wednesday in Copenhagen, there was a community dialogue session um, during which the group heard from a couple of organizations that are addressing issues that will be related to how this group develops their recommendations on certain issues. One of those is the Consumer Choice Competition and Trust Review Team, or the CCTRD, TRT, which is developing a series of recommendations, some of which are prerequisite, some of which are recommended, some of which need to be sort of eventually addressed at some point. And um, they gave a couple of really relevant recommendations to brand owners. We also heard from the um, cross-community working group on the use of country and territory names, which relates back to the geographic names issue I mentioned before. Um, they have an interim paper that has been published and, and open for public comment about um, sort of the balancing of legitimate rights in names and then government interest in those same names. Um, we also discussed sort of an updated timeline, um, which I'll show you in a couple of slides. So to review the work tracks in the new GTLD subsequent rounds policy group is uh, process support and outreach, which largely has to do with applicants. If you are a DOT brand applicant or you're, con you're considering being a DOT brand applicant, that's a pretty important work track for you to be aware of. Um, legal and regulatory is work track two, and that deals with um, things like um, the base registry agreement and uh, some of the issues with the, the rights protection mechanisms that deal with legal, legal issues. Um, the work track three um, is string contentions, objections, and dispute resolution. Um, that's very important insofar as we want to address things like um, string similarity and legal rights objections and how we would object to, um, to certain TLDs that seem to um, be preying on trademark owners, for example. Uh, IDN's technical and operational has to do with things like universal acceptance of GTLDs that are in scripts other than the traditional ASCII Latin script. Um, and then finally, there's an overarching issues team that is further split because all we need is more teams, further split into three sub-teams um, that are drafting teams uh, that are addressing different TLD types, so communities, geos, generics, brands, um, predictability and community engagement, which is important, um, and then applications being assessed in rounds and what are the issues related to that. Uh, in community comment too, some of the most relevant topics for brand owners include um, issues with reserved names. So. Um, 
how people are dealing with what you can and cannot register. Um, closed generics, so whether or not a, um, a registry operator can own a generic term like .book or .car and restrict it to um, registration in their business interest, for example, or whether or not generic terms have to be open to registration of, of a lot of people. That was a huge issue in the first round. <laughs> so we're looking forward to seeing how that's going to be dealt with in the next round at the front end so that there's sort of less confusion and more predictability for applicants and that um, you know, business plans can be more appropriately developed on the front end rather than scrambling to try to um, take into account these, these, um, these policy thoughts later. Um, string similarity was a big issue, so that was related to uh, most often singulars and plurals, so uh, applications for a car and cars and hotel and hotels and whether or not um, it's reasonable to allow those uh, extremely similar uh, TLDs to coexist, often in some cases doubling the necessity of defensive registration for some brand owners. Uh, there's also a, a question about public interest commitments and what registries need to commit to doing um, as far as uh, what's in the global public interest, including the interest of brand owners and consumers, which is um, of particular relevance to us. Uh, legal rights objection is on the, um, on the agenda to discuss, as is geographic names. So um, in the Wednesday session when we heard from the CCTRT, we, uh, we received, like I said, some recommendations for subsequent rounds. I pulled out a selected few that I think are most relevant to brand owners and most interesting to brand owners. These recommendations are also out for public comment, so if we have thoughts about this and we'd like to hear from you if you have thoughts about it, um, we have an opportunity to sort of give our feedback to the team on this, these things. Um, one of the prerequisites is that the group needs to address the cost related to uh, defensive registration. Specifically, uh, they've recommended that it needs to be reduced, particularly for the small number of brands that register large number of domains. Now, I particularly take issue with the, with the idea that there were only a small number of brands that had to um, bear huge costs related to defensive registrations. I think large and small brands um, in huge numbers had to deal with costs related to defensive registration, and I think all of those concerns need to be addressed as a prerequisite for subsequent rounds. Um, so that, for example, is something that I would like to comment on um, in our capacity as Merck Monitor. Um, so I'd also like to sort of get some more clarity from the CCTRT why their, those recommendations were, were um, specifically related to only the small number of brands that register large number of domains in a defensive way. Um, they also said that, they, that the group needs to create incentives for registries to increase relationship of content to, of a GTLD to its name, um, restrict registrations based on implied messages of trust in the name, and address safety and security concerns of personal and sensitive information, particularly related to those TLDs in the health and financial industry, or that have a nexus with the health and financial industry. Um, this is specifically related to the trust, the consumer trust portion of the CCTRT's mandate, and it's most, uh, most related to um, these sort of highly regulated industries like .lawyer, .health, .bank, um, in which there is an impression of the consumer, according to surveys, that any registration in those TLDs is, has somehow been vetted in a way that, um, that relates to a consumer's trust when they're looking at that industry. So, for example, if you're meeting with a lawyer, you're assuming that he's, uh, he or she is a member of the bar, in good standing. When you go to a doctor, you're assuming that she's licensed and she went to med school and, you know, et cetera. So I think that it's, um, that's an interesting recommendation. I wonder how it will apply um, to all GTLDs or specifically to a subset of GTLDs that have a heightened sense of trust with consumers. So that's something specifically to watch. Um, 
they want the, the, the public interest commitments in the application and in the registry agreement to specifically state the goals of any public interest requirements, and um, they want registra uh, registry operators to specifically spell out where they have committed to voluntary public interest commitments in their application. I think there was a lot of confusion about what the public interest commitments, which was specification 11 in the registry agreement, really was doing for consumers and for registrants and for registry operators, what the intention was. And I think that, um, that their requirements or their ask of the um, subsequent rounds uh, development working group uh, to, to help the uh, registry operators spell this out will help alleviate a lot of that confusion. Uh, there were also some recommendations about how uh, the government needs to give their advice the gov through the Governmental Advisory Committee or the GAC um, in order to assure predictability for applicants. Um, some of us will re recall that in the first round, after the applications were published, the government came up with a bunch of recommendations related to these that were pretty, pretty fairly classified as out of left field. So they were objecting to all sorts of different things, and they were, um, you know, you'll remember the most famous example was that they objected to .amazon, and um, to this day have sort of effectively prevented .amazon from, um, or from Amazon for proceeding with the .amazon application. And these are the types of things that um, we needed to know ahead of time before we as brand owners and, and uh, registry operators needed to actually uh, before we we put all the money and effort into, into applying in the first place. Um, they've also made recommendations about applicant support and community applications and string confusion, um, all things that will be sort of important to understand as we move forward in the next round. This is the updated timeline for new GTLD subsequent rounds. Um, as you can see, the work tracks are all still working. We're in that first sort of blue section, um, and then the work tracks will concurrently work to incorporate the input from the community comment too. Um, and then hopefully by uh, mid to the end of the year, the full working group are going to review work track recommendations and we'll be able to draft an initial report for community evaluation. So um, I, I tend to think that these timelines are overly optimistic, um, but it does look like we're we, um, we may be considering uh, reviewing final policy recommendations uh, for subsequent rounds by the end of 2018 or the beginning of 2019, and an application round may, um, in fact, um, commence shortly after that time. So something to think about. So what are the brand action items and concerns related to subsequent rounds? Why does all that matter? Um, here's what you have to do. You need to participate in community comment too if you care about these issues. Um, you can work through the intellectual property or business constituencies that I can. Um, the International Trademark Association, if you're a member, is, are working on um, a response to community comment too. The brand registry group, I'm sure, is evaluating community comment too on, on behalf of um, dot brand applicants or future applicants. Uh, there are two public comment periods open, like I said, the CCTRT recommendations and the geographic names cross-community working group um, initial paper. Um, these are all opportunities for brands to express their concerns in a way that the policy development process uh, will take it into account. So if you're interested in that, certainly please contact us and we'll mentor you through sort of how to participate. Another big issue on the policy front uh, that was discussed in Copenhagen was the rights protection mechanisms for all GTLDs. So, of course, there are some that were developed specifically for the new GTLD program and some that will, um, after the review, be applied um, to all GTLDs, including the 22 legacy TLDs like .com. Um, as a review, the phase, the RPM review is split into two phases. Um, phase one, address the trademark PDDRP or the trademark post delegation dispute resolution procedure. That was a dispute resolution procedure for those that are harmed by new GTLD registry operator conduct. The trademark one specifically was related to registry operators complicity in trademark infringement. Um, it was very, very underutilized. And so there was a lot of examination um, uh, and conclusions about trying to figure out why it was underutilized. Was it cost? Was it burden? Um, were we not exactly sure what the 
you know, what it was supposed to be used for and how, um, and all of those things will be addressed with the, within the RPM group. Um, we're currently discussing the trademark clearinghouse, um, Sunrise and Trademark Claim Service portion of this. Um, the, the group has split into three sub-teams with relation to those two middle bullet points. Uh, addressing Sunrise registration, trademark claims, and then additional voluntary production mechanisms, which I'll, I'll talk about in a couple minutes here. Um, but then at the end of phase one, we're going to discuss the uniform rapid suspension system, which I think a lot of um, brand owners have strong opinions about, including opinions about whether or not the remedy was adequate, whether or not the process was appropriate, whether or not the goals of the ERS, which was to create a cheaper, faster UDRP type process for suspension of domain names was actually adequately addressed with what the ERS ended up being. Uh, phase two of the RPM review, which is very, very important to brand owners, uh, will be addressing and reviewing the Uniform Dispute Resolution Policy or the UDRP. Uh, brand owners rely almost entirely on the UDRP when addressing domain abuse, um, and so this is a, a big thing for brand owners, um, but we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> the, uh, the last issue, um, which is related to one of the sub-teams that we've recently broken into, the additional voluntary protection mechanism, uh, it's sort of meant to address things like registry-specific RPMs, such as block lists, the global protected marks list that was pioneered by Donuts. Um, some members of the group do not believe that it's within our remit to review things that weren't policy recommendations that I can. However, uh, my personal opinion about this is that back in 2011 when we were discussing these policies and I just had started working in this ICANN world, um, I recall that a lot of the arguments against making things like a block list policy with an ICANN was because they were worried about implementation feasibility. Now that we have evidence that registries can implement things like block lists that is not only feasible but very, very useful and heavily utilized by brand owners, I think it's worth going back and addressing whether or not that should become rights protection mechanism policy. So we'll see how that ends up being addressed within the group. So related to our discussions with Trademark Clearinghouse in Copenhagen, we had a really good discussion with the Trademark Clearinghouse administrators at Deloitte. Some of the topics we reviewed were um, education about how to record marks into the, um, into the clearinghouse, what the criteria and process is, uh, transparency of the operations of the clearinghouse by Deloitte, um, verification and updating um, of the records. So for example, are they verifying that this is still a live mark? Is it is it, you know, is anybody opposing it? Is it, has it been abandoned, et cetera? And then updating records accordingly. What the costs of recordal are, and then of course access and accessibility of the, of the database, which um, I'll discuss more in a minute. Um, we're also reviewing as a group the Trademark Clearinghouse Charter Questions the two big ish, biggest issues in Copenhagen were the discussion of the recordal of things like design marks and things like geographic indications, which aren't traditional marks. Um, and the goal is that we want to really understand what trademark rights really allow brand owners to do and balance that with other legitimate rights, including the right to free expression, the right to use trademarks um, in a fair use way, and then also the right to coexist with a trademark either by using the term in a generic way or by, um, you know, by having legitimate coexistence through services of a different class or goods and services, for example. Um, so, Lots of discussion about that. Obviously, a super polarized discussion between trademark owners and people that are traditionally more um, concerned about free speech and free expression. Um, and it will be sort of interesting to see how that continues to play out within the group. Um, on March 10th, so right before we officially commenced the meeting in Copenhagen, um, the ICANN Working Group received a letter from um, a group of self-appointed trademark scholars, uh, primarily academics in the field of trademark law, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or the EFF, um, stating that they were concerned about what they called special rights 
given to trademark owners through the administration of the rights protection mechanism and specifically the trademark clearinghouse to, quote, prevent the registration of domain names that contain trademarks. Um, their point really was that there are limits to trademark rights, as we, as we stated, and um, most, most related to uh, how we register trademarks as brand owners in classes of goods and services, um, but recordal in the trademark clearinghouse gives us the opportunity to obtain sunrise registration in GTLDs that do not necessarily have a nexus with the good, classes of goods and services that we, um, we have registered our marks in. Um, if that concerns you that they have the feeling that this is creating special rights and that maybe the solution of that would be to limit the ability of brand owners to have Sunrise registration in GTLDs that are not directly related to, to um, the limits of their trademark rights, as these scholars have put it, uh, you, you should be concerned. That, that's an accurate and adequate response to that. Um, I think that what, um, what these scholars are missing sort of right off the bat is that nothing in the rights protection mechanisms, not Sunrise registration and not um, trademark claims, actually prevents registration of domain names um, that are related to free speech and uh, free expression and fair use. Um, in fact, a trademark claim is just a notice that there's a recordal in the trademark clearinghouse, and if you are confident as a registrant that you're using it in a way that constitutes fair use, then you are free to proceed with registration. Um, also, if you have, a, as a brand owner, if you have obtained a Sunrise registration um, and someone feels that that's an error based on the limitations of your trademark rights, there's a dispute resolution procedure that ICANN has developed for that purpose. Um, so personally, I think that the concerns in the, in the letter um, are a little short on a full understanding of the rights protection mechanism policy. And I think that, um, that people that are concerned about these should participate more in the policy development process so that we can sort of reach a common understanding and a compromise on any of the concerns that, uh, that have been um, expressed. One of the other big concerns in Copenhagen was transparency of the trademark clearinghouse data or the records in the um, clearinghouse. This has long been a concern of brand owners and what we'll be seeking to do uh, with this issue is to understand what, what additional benefit uh, transparency into the clearinghouse records may provide um, because most of the records are based on rights that are public and accessible in the real world. So, for example, you can search um, trademarks in the USPTO test database, and those are public. Um, but the trademark clearinghouse may, have a, may expose a situation where a brand owner has registered a subset of their marks, which would um, shed some light on their specific domain protection strategy and how they value their brands. Is that something that the public has a right to, to see and what is the value of that for legitimate purposes and then what's the value of that to cyber squatters and then how do we balance, balance those two things? So really super interesting, at least to me, but I'm a nerd, so really super interesting um, things up for discussion within the RPM group. Um, so we're preparing for future discussions specifically related to Sunrise, um, related to premium names, restricted Sunrise availability according to trademark classes, like I said, and cost of Sunrise. That was the dot sucks thing, if you remember. Brand owners really, really cared that Sunrise registration was so much more expensive than, um, than land, general availability. Um, for claims, we'll be looking at um, were trademark claims useful? Um, should we extend the periods of it? What should the language of the claims notice be? Does it constitute a legal notice to registrants that allows us to proceed more easily with the UDRP or a URS? Um, we'll also be looking at the URS um, from a utility and a remedy perspective, like was the remedy really useful to us? Um, and examining some use cases. And I think brand owners really need to start preparing for the discussion about the UDRP. If you like the UDRP, um, try to figure out if you can articulate why so that we can present that um, within the policy conduct as we move forward. 
All right, okay, so me. So <laughs> here we go. Um, I want to give a brief update on what happened with uh, in Copenhagen at the end of the meeting about doc feedback. Um, if you recall, some of you will recall that um, Mark Monitor, along with some of our, um, our some of our clients and, and some of our just colleagues in the brand community, including Adobe, American Apparel, Best Buy, Facebook, uh, Levi, Verizon, and the American Apparel and Footwear Association filed an 1,800-page complaint under the Public Interest Commitment Dispute Resolution Policy Framework to ICANN. Um, that was submitted in October. We alleged misconduct um, related to uh, a number of transparency violations of the registry operator for DOT feedback, which is called Top Level Spectrum, or TLS. Um, but I think the big allegation was we alleged some complicity in, and even a potential association with the registration of thousands of brand names without brand owner knowledge, and most importantly, with fraudulent who is records that were not appropriately verified. Um, we also alleged that brand owners, because their, um, their email address and contact information was fraudulently included without their knowledge or permission in who is records received phishing emails, um, and that the content of the website, which was populated as a feedback platform, similarly to the business model of like Yelp or TripAdvisor, um, included fraudulent contact information uh, related to um, companies like, like a false consumer protection line, which um, aims at defrauding consumers for a number of different reasons. Um, the pick here, there, there was a, a panelist, um, sorry, a three-panelist panel um, that was appointed to address our, our complaint. It was the first time uh, that a PIC DRP resulted in the convening of a panel. Uh, the panel did find TLS in breach. So I want to pause and just say congratulations to everybody for even getting that far in the PIC DRP and congratulations for having ultimately a positive response. However, because there's always a however with ICANN, <laughs> it was a very technical and limited breach notice. Now, um, I will say that um, the panel refused to apply the PIC DRP specifically to our allegations of fraud. And that's where we um, sort of are, are not super happy about the decision. The PIC DRP, according to some within the community, um, is very limited on what kind of activities it can apply to when addressing alleged misconduct of the registry operator. And the panelists took a very strict, very constructionist approach on the language of the PIC DRP, and as a result, even though they expressed sympathy with our arguments about the alleged fraud and the complicity and the association of TLS with the, um, with the fraud, we, uh, they, they were reluctant to apply the PIC DRP principles to it. However, they did say that there has been a lack of transparency in relation to the policy applicable to free dot feedback. That's where, that is the platform in which all of these fraudulent websites were and fraudulent who is records were, were registered through. Um, it, they said that TLS had not a, adhered to its own policy requirement of verifying the email address of registrants and suspending the domain if registration fails um, to, to verify. Um, they also said that, that they were, uh, they had not adhered to its policy requirement to incorporate who is data of a trademark owner directly into a new registration. Um, and so essentially a lot of our points were well taken um, in, by the panel. And, but we have not yet gotten to the point where the panel has prescribed a remedy. So our next steps with thought feedback is going to be to try to figure out how ICANN and ICANN compliance uh, may move forward with addressing these policy violations as spelled out by the registry operator. Um, speaking totally in my, in my personal capacity and not as a member of the coalition that filed this complaint, um, I would assume that the next steps would be either that they would correct the who is records to live actual information, who, who actually registered these domain names, and or cancel the domain names as what is required of them under the who is accuracy specification to verify contact information. Um, but we'll have to sort of take a wait and see approach on that. So that's what's going on with that feedback. 
All right, now I will pass it off to Janelle to talk a little bit about the Privacy Proxy Services Accreditation Implementation Team. All right, thanks, Karen, for covering all of those really important topics. Um, so to talk more about uh, Privacy Proxy Service Accreditation Implementation, which is also known as PPSAI, um, this is a program that will require privacy and proxy service providers to go through an accreditation uh, program with ICANN and then actually enter into a, a contract uh, with specific um, rules and regulations on what they can and cannot do. So to kind of go over a summary of um, the privacy and proxy service accreditation um, policy development process, which comes before the implementation review team, um, this group developed their final recommendations um, in 2015, and those recommendations were approved by the GNSO Council in January of 2016, and then the ICANN Board in August of 2016. Um, shortly after those were approved, uh, it then moved to the implementation review team, um, which we'll go into further detail on the next slide. Um, but some of these policy recommendations are outlined on the slide below. Um, which included some voluntary best practices for privacy and proxy service providers. Um, and in, what's really important for brand holders um, is the disclosure framework. And this outlines when um, and how brand holders can request the underlying information on a domain name that is using a privacy and proxy service um, information. So this is the current calendar um, for the privacy and proxy service provider implementation review time team to, uh, and what they need to do in order to accomplish um, their and finalize their work. Um, when the implementation review team began their work in late 2016, they initially had a two-year timeline. However, they recently decided to condense this um, to attempt to complete this work by the end of 2017. So that gives us about eight months um, to fully complete the implementation review. Um, including at least two public comment periods. Um, the reason they are condensing this is because of the specification in the registrar agreement um, outlining some rules around policy and uh, privacy and proxy um, that expires in January 2018. So the intent is to actually finalize the privacy and proxy service accreditation process before that clause does expire. Um, because, and that ideally will get um, ICANN prepared to actually start accepting applications for accreditation by early 2018, and they are planning on having, or estimating to having at least 200 uh, privacy and proxy service providers apply for accreditation within that first window. Um, so to take a closer look at what needs to happen in that time frame within the next eight months, um, that is gonna, the group will finish reviewing the policy docu document um, and including they will review the contract questions on the initial policy. The current intent is to have the policy and pri or privacy and um, proxy service accreditation contract closely mirror the registrar accreditation agreement. So um, it's bringing everything that's required from the policy um, development group in line with that upcoming contract. Um, and we're also waiting on law enforcement to outline their framework on deaccreditation and transfers which will be another critical piece uh, for all of us involved. Um, we'll also do a final review of um, the accreditation contract and prepare all of these materials for at least one public comment period, um, which if we stay on schedule, will open in September of 2017. Um, we will take all the information that we receive in the public comment period and make any changes and may or may not go into a second public comment period at the very end of 2017. Um, I do think this is gonna be a very important thing to comment on for brand holders. So Karen and I, are, I will send out notification when that public comment period opens um, so that you can participate in that. So to kind of focus more on what is really critical in this group for brand holders, um, there's two main parts to the privacy and proxy service accreditation implementation. The first part is the actual accreditation requirements, but the second and the most critical one for brand holders is the abuse reporting framework, um, specifically the disclosure framework. Um, so this is going to be an important part of your enforcement process once uh, this is fully outlined and implemented. So we're currently uh, discussing abuse reporting specifically finalizing the definition of abuse, 
um, which right now the plan is to basically mirror that definition as it's being used across multiple other ICANN contracts so that everyone is consistent across, across the board on what the definition of abuse is. Um, we're also discussing who can submit an abuse report, what will be required in an abuse report, um, and then what the privacy and prophecy service provider must do when responding to abuse reports. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important this is, this will be to brand holders and their enforcement efforts. Uh, so let's talk about getting involved with this group. So there's currently about 40 members of the implementation review team, and I can tell you most of the members are registrars. So we are definitely lacking the voice of brand holders. Um, and again, this is going to be a critical part um, of a brand holder's enforcement process um, as we dig more into the disclosure framework and the abuse uh, information. So Karen and I will give you more information on how to get involved with all of these groups um, at the end of the presentation, or feel free to reach out to us individually if you want more information on these topics. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it back to Kieran, who's going to talk about everyone's favorite topic, uh, the future of who is. Yes, it is everyone's favorite topic, which is why I'm going to spend about one minute on it, <laughs> because <laughs> there are a lot of things going on with who is, and it really would require its own webinar. So maybe I'll do that, and you guys can tune in at that point. But until then, let's just review a little bit about what, we're, what we discussed in Copenhagen and, and uh, what's going on. So the Who is um, Registration Directory Services or RDS Policy Development Process Working Group met in Copenhagen a couple of times. Um, we did have a face-to-face -face on, on Saturday, the first day of the meeting. Um, a lot of things are being discussed and a lot of um, really important principles are being sort of memorialized within this group. But if you back out of all of that and come back to what this group is really trying to accomplish, uh, here's what I would say in a nutshell. They're trying to figure out what the fundamental requirements are for collecting, maintaining, and accessing registration data. And they're trying to figure out if the current system of who is accurately represents those fundamental requirements. They're going to take into account privacy and privacy law, data privacy law in particular, in particular is rapidly evolving, particularly in Europe. Um, we're going to talk about consumer protection and the importance of transparency and accessibility and accuracy of this information. We're going to talk about law enforcement concerns. We're talking about brand and IP enforcement concerns, data retention laws, um, and how these policies um, take that into account. Uh, Etc. So all of these things are ultimately getting to what are the requirements for registration data and how might that contribute to either transparency or opaqueness in who is record. Of course, our, um, our fundamental concern as Mark Monitor across all of our product lines is accessibility accuracy and transparency of the data. The importance of that to brand owners and consumers cannot be understated. Who is records and registration data for websites is the number one most important thing for us when we are working to stop the influx of illegal pharmaceuticals, dangerous counterfeits, um, and really all sorts of problematic things um, in which a lot of consumer protection companies, including Mark Monitor, um, are really working hard towards that goal. Um, in Copenhagen, one of the other things that, that, um, that the Who Is group did was uh, facilitate a discussion with, uh, or sorry, participate in a discussion with the Data Protection Unit of the Council of Europe. We provided a number of questions to the representatives from the, uh, from the council, and uh, it was related to everything from jurisdiction to privacy to um, consumer protection and all sorts of topics. And they collected our questions and thanked us for them, probably sarcastically, and <laughs> will revert back to the group with their specific answers on those issues, which will, will be integrated into, um, into the, uh, the policy framework, discussion framework as we move forward. Um, there are a lot, like I said, there are lots of things happening with who is There um, is the implementation of the SICK who is policy recommendations, which were finally approved and are on the path to implementation um, by 2018 and 2019, depending on which registry you are. Obviously, .com will take the longest. Um, who is complex and national law recommendations um, are currently up for discussion, so that's going to be about data retention laws, and, uh, and then the next point is data retention waivers for registrar registrars who have 
received a legal opinion that their processes are actually in violation of data protection and retention law. Um, who is conflicts with national um, privacy, data privacy laws will be sort of a hot topic moving forward as, as that area of the law um, continues. Um, obviously, the expert working group gave their recommendations about registry directory services and had recommended gated access, so we'll be discussing sort of what that might look like and who would have access, who would get behind the gate and for what, what data elements. And um, so finally, what is the timing and what's next? This stuff moves incredibly slowly, um, even by policy standards. So I'm thinking that we aren't going to get anywhere. Janelle's laughing at me because it's true. <laughs> uh, we aren't getting anywhere on this um, for at least five years, and I wouldn't expect a, a policy recommendations for a new RDS for at least a decade. Um, but brand owners do need more of a voice here in the, on these issues, as Janelle has stated. And so if you're interested in sort of following these things and getting involved where, you know, where those opportunities present themselves, um, that is certainly a, a, a important thing for brand owners. All right, I'll pass it back to Janelle to talk a little bit about our partners at ICANN. Thanks, Karen. So developing and maintaining our partnerships is a critical part of our involvement at ICANN. And I just want to highlight uh, a few of the things that we do at ICANN meetings when um, engaging with our partners. So the first one um, is, uh, the Brand Registry Group, also known as the BRG. So from ICANN standards, this is a fairly new group. It's only been around um, since the beginning of or this current round of uh, GTLDs. But over the last couple of years, they have really defined their purpose and are becoming a great source of information um, and advocacy for dot brand holders. Um, and I should emphasize the BRG is for current dot brand applicants, but also future dot brand uh, applicants as well. Um, and their operators and representatives. So here I have uh, both their outline, um, their purpose and mission, and then also their mission at ICANN. Um, it's, a, it's a great group for brands to share ideas on how you're, they're using their TLDs. Um, they've also had great discussions within their group on different obstacles that dot brand applicants have with getting their own companies to buy in on using their dot TLDs, which I think is an invaluable discussion um, and it helps dot brand applicants actually share information, ideas, and resources together um, so that uh, to kind of strengthen the dot brand space. This kind of just highlights who the current members are of the BRG. And again, I want to emphasize that this is not restricted to current applicants. So if you are planning on applying for a dot brand in the future, um, it is a great group to get involved with to kind of help. Uh, shape your own ideas on what you could be using a dot brand for and how to get your own company engaged with um, the idea of applying for a dot brand in the future. Um, I also just want to highlight the great work of our global relationships team that attended ICANN 58 in Copenhagen. They met uh, with about 50 of our registry partners uh, over four days, which is a lot. Um, and this just highlights some of the registries that we met with. Um, and when we do meet with registries, registries directly, we are advocating on behalf of brand holders. Um, so we are talking about things like increasing in pricing and our objection to that, um, the inclusion of trademark names on premium lists, um, different registry changes um, to rules and processes, and other things that may or may not be uh, friendly to brand holders. Um, so as you can imagine, there are some pretty interesting conversations, but a lot of really productive things come out of these discussions. Uh, and again, building those relationships with these registries so that they are hearing our voice um, about brand issues, I think is extremely critical. So next, I'm going to pass it back to Kieran to talk about why you should get involved with brand holder with uh, ICANN. So I think at the end of the day, a lot of um, what we hear about from brand owners is that they're not entirely sure how ICANN relates to them, especially if they're not necessarily on the domain side, but they are concerned about brand protection generally. Um, so some of these are going to seem like hyperbole, but <laughs> I want you to, um, to understand that some of these are very, very true. Your ability to enforce your rights online are being threatened by some of the some of the folks who are advocating certain policy goals within ICANN. Um, we spoke about that before. So, for example, if who is becomes opaque and brand owners have to have a court order or they have to have you know go through some sort of complex um, you know pseudo legal procedure to get even the basic who is records, 
your ability to enforce your right online, rights online are going to change drastically. Um, your ability to protect your brand proactively is being threatened. So we spoke in the RPM group about, um, about the fact that folks are trying to restrict the ability of brand owners to register their, um, their, domain, their trademarks in, um, in Sunrise registration unless there's some sort of, you know, direct nexus between an international class of goods and service uh, that you've registered in and the GTLD itself. Um, that is problematic for brand owners, and it, it doesn't really take into account the scope of trademark rights. Um, and so we want to make sure that the brand voice is accurately represented in that respect. Um, also, another reason why you should get involved, which is not as scary as, <laughs> as the first two, is that there are new and interesting opportunities for brand presence in the domain name space. Um, it's really interesting to see how brands are using dot brands, and um, it's really interesting to see um, what people are doing to utilize the new GTLD program in general, not just dot brands, to, um, to have a, a really new and interesting um, Space for their company on the internet, um, and so uh, it, it's a good time to get involved for sort of exciting and positive reasons um, as well. There is an imbalance of legal experts. There is an imbalance of viewpoints. Uh, Janelle sort of really um, well represented the imbalance of uh, brand voices in the uh, in the privacy proxy realm. Uh, that's important. That's an issue that is big for our clients. We hear about it every day, multiple times a day, how problematic privacy proxy is. And yet we're not on these groups. And it will really affect our ability to enforce online, not just domain names, but um, abusive content as well. And so if you want to participate, um, it's really important to do so. And there's four main um, groups that you can get involved with that we listed here. This doesn't include um, all of the different policy development groups that you can also get involved with, including all of the ones we've discussed today. So privacy and proxy implementation, subsequent procedures, um, the future of who is, all of those are also available for you to participate in. If you need help kind of navigating which group you could make the biggest impact or would fit your needs, please feel free to reach out to Kieran and I and we can help guide you in figuring out where is the best um, the best group to fit what you need and, and your availability. Um, and upcoming meetings going on. So there's four between now and the, next, the end of the year. Um, the first one is the GDD Summit. So this is for um, contracted parties with ICANN, so registries and registrars, but that does include brand uh, registry members. So if you're a dot brand applicants, um, that is open to you, as well as uh, there's the INTA meeting also in Spain in May. Uh, you can stay for both if you want. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Um, then we also have the ICANN Policy Forum in Johannesburg in June. This is a very condensed four-day policy-only meeting, so it is very condensed. Um, and the next, the last meeting of the year is the general meeting in Abu Dhabi. This is probably the better meeting for a first-timer to attend an ICANN meeting because it is going to be uh, the more traditional seven-day meeting that includes um, meetings with the board, um, cross-constituency topics, high-interest topics, um, as well as just other general meetings that would be valuable for uh, brand holders to get involved with. So, um, so that's it for our presentation today. Um, I do see a couple of questions. I'm just going to really quickly um, uh, answer one of them. Um, the question is, for someone who's currently not involved at ICANN, what is the first group that you should get involved in? Um, here, here's my recommendation for that. Um, don't blindly get involved with any of it. Instead, reach out to the people in your business sphere, including us at Mark Monitor, and have a conversation about what your brand protection strategy is and what your domain protection strategy is, and then let's figure out an engagement strategy. I think jumping into ICANN with both feet can be really overwhelming. And if you have some mentorship, I think that that sort of helps soften the blow of that, I would say. So we'd be happy to have conversations with everybody offline. Um, for the other couple of folks that have some questions, um, we will reach out directly or feel free to reach out to us directly. Our email address is here. Our, our email addresses are here at the end of the, of, the, um, of the presentation. So I will pass it back to Ian to, uh, to close us out and thank you everybody for joining. Thank you.
Great. Uh, well, thanks again, Janelle and Kieran. We appreciate sh you sharing all those updates from Copenhagen with the audience. I'd also like to thank everyone for tuning in for the, with their participation. And as a reminder, we'll be sending out a follow-up email with a link to this webinar's presentation slides and recording in the next couple of days. So look out for that. And uh, this concludes our webinar today. Thanks again for tuning in and have a great day, everyone.